Welcome to the Drug Effect, uh, the Body and Mind. This is the second from a series of four panel discussions as part of the Beyond the Influence, uh, a, drug, a Drug Awareness Campaign organized by KSU. During these two hours, we shall be discussing the topic of drug use from the medical health point of view, and we are joined today by five medical professions to do so. This panel discussion is being organized by KSU in collaboration with MMSA, MHSA, MPSA and Wolves. In brief, the panel discussion will be based on raising awareness on the effects of drug use on the body and mind, how drug use affects one's performance in his or her daily tasks, such as work, studies, sports and fitness, and about enhancing the effectiveness of drug treatment and rehabilitation in order to reduce the use of illicit drugs. Moreover, we will also be discussing the use of, and accessibility of medical cannabis and we will move to talk about uh, over-the-counter medicine and mental illness as a possible cause of substance use and addiction. And now I will move on to introduce the panelists who have kindly agreed uh, to form part of this discussion in no particular order. Um, so uh, we are joined today by Dr. Andrew Ajus. Um, Dr. Andrew Ajus is the founder and medical director of the Pain Clinic, an integrative medical center for the interdisciplinary management of chronic pain and other illnesses which have not responded to conventional medicine. Dr. Ajus was one of the first Maltese doctors to recommend CBD to his patients and is now one of Malta's top medical cannabis prescriptions. Subscribers. He is also the founder of Kanatalim, an educational initiative for better understanding of the endocannabinoid system and use of cannabis as a medicine. Next, we have Dr. Janice Vellazzi, uh, who studied pharmacy at the University of Malta and went on to obtain a PhD degree in 2015. Her research work has been presented in several pharmaceutical and medical conferences. Within the, Dr. Vellasan is also part of the Department of Pharmacy. She is involved in the teaching in teaching several units and is also actively involved in the running of laboratories. Dr. Vellazzi is also involved in the supervision of a number of undergraduate and postgraduate students. Her research interests include the analysis of drugs in biological fluids and cannabis for medicinal use. We are also joined by Dr. Vella, Dr. Daniel Vella Fondacaro. Dr. Daniel Vella Fondacaro is a specialist trainee in psychiatry and a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Dr. Vella Fondacaro is currently reading another Master of Science degree in Sport and Exercise Psychology with, Stat with Staffordshire University. His personal interests include sports, social policy and history. During these past years, Dr. Vella Fondacaro has campaigned heavily for the promotion of health and well-being and held several executive positions in several organizations. Our fourth speaker is Ms. Joanna Bellia. Ms. Joanna Bellia first joined the University of Malta as a full-time academic in 1992 after completion of her occupational therapy studies in the first locally run course. She has recently obtained certification on completion of an EU course on gender-based violence. She currently teaches on the BSc program where she sits on various committees and is coordinator of clinical practice. She has a special interest in substance abuse, PTSD and domestic violence. Last but not least, the surgeon captain Dr. Christopher Mikalev is one of our is one of four commissioned military doctors working within the medical center of the armed forces of Malta. Following the completion of the Malta Foundation program, he embarked upon further medical training as a basic specialist trainee in psychiatry at Mount Carmel Hospital, harnessing a keen interest in addiction psychiatry. During his studies, he was identified to join the Armed Forces of Malta as commissioned non-combatant medical officer and was tasked with a number of duties relating to his medical profession. He is pursuing his studies within mental health and has successfully completed, contributed to the setup of weekly multidisciplinary clinic within the AFM. Thank you all for being here. 
And now we shall pass on to the questions. So let us start the discussion. Um, uh, so most often when people go out uh, to leisure, adults uh, usually actually um, take drugs, maybe not illicit drugs, but they still take some form of drugs because they make them feel happy, relaxed, more confident. So if drugs have these positive effects on the body, why are they such a problem? So let's... Uh, discuss what is a drug first. So a drug is a substance that has a physical or a psychological effect on the body. And society conditions us to think that to associate the word drug with something illegal. But in reality, drugs can range from alcohol and tobacco to over-the-counter medications, prescription medications, and also the illegal drugs. Why do people take drugs? People take drugs because indeed they want to change an aspect of their life. So they can take them for a medical purpose to get better or feel better in the case of a pharmaceutical. They can take them maybe socially to feel more accepted in the case of alcohol or tobacco. And they can also take them recreationally as in the case of many illegal drugs. Now, Different drugs act on different neurotransmitters, these chemicals in the body, um, which cause um, particular effects. And these different neurotransmitters create um, different, um, they have different roles in the body. And one of the very important neurotransmitters in the body is dopamine. Dopamine, which is associated with th th this feeling of reward, this feeling of motivation. It's that chemical that when secreted in high amounts, we are more motivated to do things. It gets us out of bed. It makes us want to go to work. And there are these normal levels of dopamine which the individual might have present um, in their brain um, in different levels, in different times of their day. For example, on a really unmotivating, horrible day, one would have levels of dopamine in the region of about 40 nanograms per deciliter. On a really, really good day, one would have increased levels of dopamine of, let's say, 100 nanograms per deciliter. Now, what drugs do is that they boost up levels of dopamine to quite substantial amounts. So from 100 nanograms per deciliter, it can shoot up to, let's say, 1,000 nanograms per deciliter, depending on the drug of abuse in question, depending on the drug. That doesn't even have to be a drug of abuse. And this, if sustained for prolonged periods of time, can cause what is known as tolerance and dependence. So tolerance occurs when someone who takes a, a substance, a drug, a chemical, for a prolonged period of time, eventually he or she might need greater um, doses to achieve the desired effect. And uh, this obviously leads to problems. Um, uh, then we have the issue of dependence. So the body literally becomes dependent on the chemical, dependent on the drug. And uh, once you stop the individual, once the individual stops taking that chemical, he or she may get experience withdrawals. So we have physical withdrawals, um, as can see, for example, in the simple case of cessation of caffeine, one gets headaches, which can be sustained for prolonged periods of time. And then um, we can get, the individual can get psychological withdrawals, which are more involved in, 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 in manifestations of um, psychological problems, such as mood swings. Thank you for your answer. Um, so next, when we hear stories of people who were previous drug dependent, who were dependent on drugs previously, we hear that um, they started out by being occasional users, so they were non-dependent and eventually they moved on to become dependent users. However, some people can still use them occasionally and continue to use them occasionally for the rest of their lives. So my question is, why do some people become addicted to drugs whilst others do not? Shall I? Um, so so um, just to add, sort of I agree with what Janice said, um, there are legal drugs, illicit drugs and legal ones. Now, when you say user, it might be both. 
So uh, I guess you can have someone who's addicted to benzodiazepines, which is a, a, one of the medications we use on sedatives we use for anxiety and panic attack disorder, panic disorder. Um, but if we have to sort of uh, have to answer this question vis-a-vis uh, -vis the illicit drugs, um, uh, every person has a different makeup, different biochemistry, okay? Um, and also different people have different personalities. So there are people who obviously start off using occasionally, using cannabis, using cocaine. Um, and uh, there are people sort of who use occasionally and keep using occasionally. I'm not saying that it's a good thing to do because you can still have very deleterious effects and very bad side effects and complications. Um, uh, but technically it's not a dependent, a dependent syndrome, okay? Um, now, there are others who, either because of their personality or perhaps traumatic events going on in their lives, which, um, uh, I mean, exacerbate the addictive, the, the dependent syndrome through that addictive substance, they can start using the, uh, the substance uh, either in a, in a heavier form, okay, using a higher dose, in a more regular way, in a regular fashion, um, creating what um, uh, sort of Janice explained um, the dependence and the tolerance and the withdrawal effect. Um, so technically, my answer would be that different people experience different traumatic events in their lives, and uh, different people are made up of different uh, different makeup. So we can't, there's no one size fits all for this. So we can't say that definitely we can't say that all users end up being dependent. But obviously, people who are dependent. At a point in their lives, probably um, uh, they did start from using it occasionally. Um, uh, at least that's the the norm, um, uh, and uh, so that's why it's very important to start from preventive strategies and from campaigns. And very early on, when people are just using occasionally, where you need to start pitching in and helping them to uh, sort of to 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 remove the substance from the, from the system and from their, from their sort of routine. Um, that's my two cents on this. Um, and then going to what Daniel was saying, um, one can, can split the reasons why one start, becomes an addict. And to, um, the first one is the genetic component, which, which you mentioned the characteristics of the individual, which could be coming about by our parents, uh, our family members, who could also be addicts in, in some way or another. And adding to that, um, the environment we live in, our upbringing, our, our environment in, in everyday life at work, which could lead us to exacerbate the genetic factors. Um, so one should not forget that it's neither one nor the other, but but a multitude of, of components contributing to a person bringing out his addiction, so to speak, rather than pinpointing and, and blaming one issue um, for, for the... Um, I would like... Can I pitch in? Uh, thank you for the invitation um, to participate. I would like to continue a little bit along the lines of uh, what Dr. McAuliffe and Dr. Fondacaro have have mentioned as well. Um, uh, I've recently read that in about 60% of the cases, it's actually genetic because people keep not being too sure. Maybe the evidence um, uh, is a bit difficult to pin down sometimes as well, I would say. Um, but that is more the competence of, of obviously the psychiatrists. So um, uh, there is there are other facts as well that somebody i think you dr uh, mikhalev mentioned that the environment okay is is very conducive to people you know um coming across drugs for example you have to see what the availability is you know in the people around you okay the more availability maybe the more chances you are to become a user as well um it could depend as well on uh, people who have backgrounds for example who have uh, witnessed domestic abuse are actually very good candidates to become eventually users because 
Ultimately, once the physical dependence goes, which most drugs do have a physical dependence, but that in a way you can detox a little bit with them, even though you might have some permanent uh, damage, okay? Um, uh, you will find that these people um, use drugs sometimes to dull the emotional pain of the reality that they are living in. Um, uh, there are other things as well, like having young people um, uh, and peer pressure as well. Okay, so there are new drugs, newer designer drugs coming outside, uh, being produced all the time. And obviously, young people want to need a group to identify with. And with drugs as well comes sometimes a certain amount of prestige. So eventually you start as pushing something small, for example, but eventually that something small earns you money that your friends won't have. So it brings in, you know, the girls or the boys, you become popular because of this, because you have nicer clothes, nicer mobile phones, a nicer car, even though you're 18 or 17 and have no license. So uh, <laughs> they are, it's a very complex uh, um, problem as well. Um, and later on, maybe we can talk about how to tackle this from maybe younger, a younger age as well, I would say. So we, we can't forget peer pressure. And some people are intrinsically shy, for example. So, you know, having something to make you a bit different will, will make you maybe a bit more outgoing or maybe mute out certain feelings, certain emotional pain that you don't want to tackle, which is unresolved in your past. And if I had to uh, say something about why maybe some people would probably continue to use certain drugs and why others don't, um, uh, like we've already said, there's a, a big genetic component because of the way the nervous system is wired, uh, you know, in uh, different people and different personalities. But there's also the aspect of the environment when there is um, either a traumatic event or abuse or uh, some other form of uh, chronic stress, there could be changes in the nervous system that uh, make people more susceptible to, to continue using certain drugs because of the imbalances in the neurotransmitters um, uh, which would come about because of what these uh, people would have gone through. For example, um, a traumatic event in childhood especially can uh, cause you know, depletion of certain neurotransmitters and um, certain drugs whether they're drugs or abuse or even uh, therapeutic drugs. I mean, now uh, there are certain drugs of abuse, such as uh, LSD, MDMA, uh, ketamine, which are being found to be therapeutic in certain um, situations, certain patients, you know, who haven't responded to medication because they target certain neurotransmitters that uh, certain medication can't really address. You know, what one typical example is uh, treatment resistant depression, which, uh, you know, sometimes uh, patients are treated with SSRIs or SNRIs, which uh, would target certain neurotransmitters, but they don't always respond so well. So sometimes changing the kind of drug that they're uh, using either therapeutically or even recreationally, they would probably think that they're using it recreationally, but in fact, they're actually medicating themselves to feel more normal, more, um, uh, more happy, you know, and because certain people are, have maybe normal mood levels and uh, when they take a drug of abuse, or a recreational drug, it would probably increase certain neurotransmitters such as dopamine, which is temporary and would not cause any um, uh, after effect in, in them. But uh, certain others who might have uh, lower levels of these neurotransmitters or just imbalances would find that um, a recreational drug 
will actually be therapeutic. And in fact, when it comes to, for example, cannabis, um, there are a lot of what we think are recreational users who use it daily or very often, who are actually relieving their symptoms, uh, feeling better, you know, relieving certain pain, being able to sleep. Um, so in actual fact, they're actually uh, using it medically. Thank you all for your contribution. Um, so as we were discussing, uh, something that came to my mind is really how mental health has an effect on uh, drug usage. So I would say, I want to ask, this is like the case of the, which came first, the chicken or the egg? So in this case, which comes first, the mental, sorry, the wind is really loud, the drug addiction leading to a mental health issue or a mental health issue which leads to a drug addiction? Shall I, Chris? Um, uh, it, in some situations, it is actually, Sarah, chicken and the egg. Sometimes it's very difficult to know from where it's coming from. If we had to obviously um, uh, narrow this to a dependent syndrome, okay? Um, you, not not just the, recre the recreational, occasional use. Um, uh, each case to its own. So what, when you interview patients or clients, or when you um, uh, when you delve deep into the situation then you start getting a, gr a grip as to what, what, what probably came first. Um, you can have, obviously, there are different, um, uh, different uh, drugs like cocaine, which can cause um, hallucinations, can cause delusions, which are fixed false beliefs, okay, which cannot be, cannot be explained or cannot be contraindicated with, with rational arguments. Um, uh, or, for example, you can have sort of regular use of uh, regular use and heavy use of recreational cannabis, for example, for many, many years, which might actually cause some kind of psychotic components. Um, uh, those can cause, obviously, I guess, like most things in life, they can cause some kind of mental health disturbance. However, um, uh, and uh, I continue what, what Andrew said, um, some mental disorders might actually cause that client to, um, let me call it mental health symptoms and disorders, might cause that client to start using um, uh, some kind of, of drug, for example, ADHD and cannabis to cope, or um, someone who's depressed using cocaine to give them the motivation, okay, um, and so, so on and so forth. So I think my answer to that question would be every person is different and uh, you need to investigate, if you will, interview um, each and every person and getting collateral history from the relatives, etc., to know where it came from. Sometimes I see from, from I guess, my few years of experience in psychiatry, um, uh, I think the best thing, rather than trying to delve deep into what happened and why you started, I would find it sort of better to focus on being mindful, focusing on the present and where to go from here. Obviously, it's important to get a good history and know exactly why he started it, sort of to, to get an idea of the person's personality. As uh, uh, Joanna said, sort of um, it depends on uh, whether he started because of peer pressure or something like that, which might give you an insight into his experiences in secondary school or sixth form or something. Um, but most of the time, it's good to so move forward okay, and use, motiv motivate that person and responsibilize that person okay, to, to try to do something about it rather than pondering on, on what happened. E even though sometimes pondering on what happened might actually give useful information um, and, and will help us move forward as well. Um, sorry, just to add to this, um, maybe sometimes it's a bit the focus of different professionals, which is slightly different as well. So obviously a psychiatrist is interested in, in looking at as well the DSM and uh, looking at, you know, the different criteria because you need to come up with, with a diagnosis as well. So, but in other allied healthcare professions, um, 
we are more inclined to listen to the person's narrative rather. So, so we start a little bit from a different premise. We don't start because we have obviously the luxury of getting a diagnosis as well from the psychiatrist, which is very much appreciated as well. But we, we actually look at where they are not functioning because we see people as the sum total, you know, of what they do every day. If we look at humans, what we do daily is we have our habits, our roles, our routines. So we're the sum total of all these things. And obviously, as most of the people contributing today will, will have experienced, people come to you sometimes when the, something has gone wrong. The rider in trouble with the law or somebody you know a relationship is breaking up so it's the first time that they start contemplating that hey maybe now this is the time to try and do something about it so my point is that different people approach it in different ways as well okay but i see that i think the professions are very i'm coming closer together nowadays as well because the criteria are based on function as well you know so there's a there's a lot about function there so um I'll, I'll just just a small point I'll, i totally agree um ultimately everything is all about function you know? as you really whether sort of whether we give a diagnosis whether we don't give a diagnosis whether i mean it's all about function so that's the main difference between abuse and an addiction i guess and dependence syndrome um uh, when it starts impeding on the person's function be it criminally be it um um socially relationship wise school work then obviously they seek help um uh, so i'm totally agreed i think with with the arguments that that joanna and daniel made um we can appreciate the importance of, of uh, the multidisciplinary team approach where a lot of professionals give their contribution to help with, with, the, with the patient at, at the center of it all. Um, and when, whenever that focus is, is not, uh, when our focus is not the patient, then, then we start making mistakes. And when, when you get different ideas and different perspectives into, into the patient's issues, um, then I think we should get the best for the patient. And with that in mind, the patient would, would benefit most. Um, obviously, you will get patients coming for help uh, at different stages of, of the addiction, and we, we should be open to helping them regain functionality in the best way they can, in the best way that suits them most. So we should not have uh, a strict uh, criteria for, for any particular patient, but the individual care should, should be the priority. Thank you. Um, uh, as a nursing student, I couldn't agree more, and a future nurse, I couldn't agree more, and I believe a lot in the multidisciplinary team. Um, we have a question from the audience who are watching us. Um, if you just so the question is, um, how does Malta rank uh, against mainland European countries in terms of mental health issues caused by drug addiction? It's also related uh, with mental health and drug addiction. Um, how does Zoe, how does Malta rank? How does Malta rank um, uh, amongst the mainland European countries? in terms of mental health uh, issues caused by drug addiction. So vis-a-vis -vis of the, qu the quality of service we give when it comes to addiction services. So, um, I mean, honestly, I haven't worked in addiction services abroad. However, um, uh, what I can say about Malta is that we have very dedicated um, addiction services team unit, both um, uh, when it comes to an inpatient service, okay, and community services, including detox. Um, we have several rehab centers and rehab facilities, that's Caritas, SETA, um, uh, many social workers, many occupation therapists, um, uh, involved psychologists, pharmacists, psychiatrists. So I think, I guess, when it comes to our island, I, th I think we, we do give a very good service. Um, uh, I can't, honestly, I don't know whether anyone has, has, has something on this, but I can't, 
um, comment on on countries abroad. I've seen the the criteria from the EMCDDA, which is the the, the, the international criteria on on drugs, um, and and uh, I guess I guess we're quite there. You, I, I think quite similar. Um, can you actually say that uh, mental health issues are caused by drug addiction? I mean, it's, I think it's a very complicated situation because most people who get addicted to drugs have mental health issues to start off with, rather than they start recreationally and then become um, mentally ill because of their use of drugs. I mean, for example, one example, uh, such as psychosis, schizophrenia, there usually is always some genetic component that would predispose someone to developing this condition. And then obviously there are certain life events, there are certain um, substances, you know, that can promote it, that can um, precipitate it. But as such, I don't really think that you can have a person who is mentally completely stable start using recreational drugs it's i think a very small proportion of uh, drug users who actually become mentally ill because they use drugs regularly recreationally i'm not sure what, what you think no, i i think i i think as i think it's never an all or none you um you don't find you all people who use recreationally getting mental health problems or symptoms um we do get patients who who have abuse of a drug even once or twice and unfortunately even these new synthetic um uh, sort of compounds um and they, they end up admitted to hospital because of of a psychotic a transient acute psychotic episode some people might actually um have a more long-term psychotic problems regarding the uh, so obviously cannabis is the main command comes to mind regarding whether the, per the person is predisposed beforehand or not. It's again, it's something that has been um, uh, going in and out of research sort of to, to see exactly um, whether that the predisposition is an important factor. I'm sure it is. However, um, uh, I read a recent paper and evidence shows that so it, it does happen also when people have, have no family history of mental disorders, especially in this case, psychosis. Um, so I'm saying for regular heavy use. Now, um, uh, occasional regular use is a different argument. But what I can say when it comes to synthetic substances, definitely it can happen. It can easily happen. Synthetic amphetamine, synthetic cannabis, synthetic cocaine, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, and even the use of normal cocaine, huh? and, and this is something that is widely used regular, sort of occasionally um, in parties and etc. What, what is um, normal cocaine, Daniel? Sorry, normal what cocaine, yes. Normal I'm, cocaine. I normal mean, cocaine is non-synthetic cocaine, cocaine. Isn't cocaine usually always adulterated, making that even more a predisposition to it not being normal? I, I guess, but when I say normal cocaine, I'm meaning I'm, I'm, I'm vaguely dividing them into two here. Yeah. So the, the, the synthetic components where they spray chemicals on them so that they won't be traceable in the urine, mainly for forensic purposes. Um, and there are the, those where it's easily traced in the urine um, and in the blood. So um, uh, that when I say normal cocaine, I'm, I'm really referring to that. I guess, yes, normal is a, is a bit of a, not exactly the best word to use. Yeah. Um, but cocaine, let's say cocaine, I mean, we've had cases where they only use once or twice, and unfortunately we know that cocaine gives you vasospasm, um, and it can actually cause problems, sort of, uh, you know, problems, severe problems, and brain problems, if organic can, problems. If I can comment, um, I do not think we can put, classify cocaine in the same category as cannabis, especially if we are referring to cannabis as it being a natural product. Um, and research is a bit conflicting when we're trying to associate cannabis with schizophrenia. So, yes, I fully agree that if we are talking about synthetic cannabis, that is much more of a risk factor of the individual um, developing schizophrenia if he or she doesn't have a family history, as you said. But I don't think we can say 100% that people smoking natural cannabis or, or, or taking natural cannabis 
can, can, can develop schizophrenia just like that. As much as, 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 as one can with cocaine. Like, uh -huh, sorry, sorry, yeah. My impression is that uh, these so-called normal patients who you know, have no family history and no genetic predisposition, who uh, smoke high doses of cannabis and other maybe substances, make use of other substances concurrently, eventually develop a new onset schizophrenia with no family history, there would be some abnormality in the in the bio in the chemistry in the in the brain you know um, and they would be smoking because a lot i'm uh, excessively because it's they want to feel better you know and they cannot stay without it there's something wrong in the biochemistry that the cannabis is helping them with exactly. and eventually they obviously this leads to uh, disruption and uh, eventually they become psychotic but I think there is a mental health issue, a mental health problem, a genetic problem in these patients, because you know that that's why they smoke excessively because of this abnormal biochemistry. Mm -hmm. One has to make a distinction between psychosis, acute psychosis, which comes about because of, of the abuse or, or any the reaction in the body, which is acute, and schizophrenia, which is something uh, chronic and, and is a chronic disease, which obviously um, one can delineate the, the genetic and, and environmental component far better than, than the one psychosis. Acute stress reaction can cause can bring psychosis. So uh, let us let us not confuse those those two um, because th th that may be confusing um, towards our audience. Um, with respect to cannabis and psychosis, I mean, both myself and Daniel, we have, we have seen patients who obviously intermingle with, with different compounds and different types of, of cannabinoids. Um, you'd, you'd be surprised by how... Um, what do you mean different compounds and cannabinoids? In what sense? There, there are a number of... Of, um, Synthetic and natural? No, there are about 100 different cannabinoids, uh, yes. TFDs, uh, CBDs, which obviously um, the different compounds which are present on the market, um, patients mix. And, and but we know that THC is primarily responsible for, 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 for the stimulant effect on the brain. Yes, but so, still, the patients, obviously, synthetic again is part of. Synthetic. Of, of the game, but psychosis is um, a significant component of, of mental health issues, which we see in, in our practice. I'm sorry if I might add. Um, I think because this is a sort of a drug awareness campaign as well, um, uh, maybe we can focus um, slightly more on the fact that when people take certain drugs, you are going to have, you are going to create problems which are health related and many of them are related to, for example, memory. So you're getting a lot of younger people where, you know, uh, there are, most probably there are, there is certain permanent damage. I mean, in preparation for for the session today, I was sort of looking through and I found that even scans of the brain of people taking, uh, even young people who are occasional users of um, cannabis and cocaine, a mixture of things together, you can see in the scan in their brain, you can't see blood going to certain regions of the brain already. And they're very young. So obviously, if there is ischemia to certain parts of the brain, you might have. I would say that cannabis can cause ischemia to the brain, and maybe cocaine because of the vasoconstriction. I said a mixture, because some of them were users, they used three different uh, uh, drugs, so... so. Different. I mean, you can't really classify cannabis with cocaine. I mean, cannabis is exactly. extremely safe, you know. I have patients who've been using it for over 50 years, and they're sharper than many people, you know, their age. Um, so uh, you can't really say that cannabis and cocaine have the same effects on the brain. I mean, cocaine is obviously very dangerous 
and cannabis is very safe, much safer than most pharmaceuticals. Definitely. In, in fact, cocaine doesn't have any therapeutic properties, just as present, and cannabis does. Um, okay, cocaine used to be used as an, an aesthetic in the past. So was heroin, it used to be used as a cough suppressant, but it is cannabis that has known therapeutic properties. So we cannot really classify them in the same basket, can we? Your discussion, sorry, go on, go ahead. Mostly cocaine users that obviously never get the benefit of anything except that initial high, which eventually might last only, you know, a very short amount of time and you have to reuse, obviously. Um, the feeling back, not not the cannabis per se. If if I can, sorry, um, oh, I I just I interrupted you. Um, I think so. Obviously, if we had to sort of subjectively classify the dangerousness of cocaine and cannabis, obviously, uh, cocaine is uh, is is more harmful and more acutely harmful, definitely. Um. Uh, but I mean, there are meta-analyses, um, huge meta-analyses saying, you know, concluding and one after the other, because obviously cannabis and psychosis has been I mean, the, the scope of research or so, so, I mean, for so many years now. Um, and there, they do conclude that long-term use of normal, natural cannabis, okay, you're not, not synthetic, none of, none of that, um, w does cause a higher, not in everyone, a large, a higher proportion of psychosis. Now, be it schizophrenia, be it schizoaffective disorder, you know, be it some kind of other um, cannabis-induced schizophrenia um, psychosis. But if the usual prevalence of psychosis in the natural population be X, in when they took huge populations of people taking cannabis for many years, and they took so check the prevalence of psychosis, not necessarily schizophrenia again. They found it's not X, it's Y, for example. You know, so and it was significantly different. It was statistically significant. So I mean, again, I don't I don't want to sort of say that oh everyone takes cannabis or lies will get to get psychotic and in the end. But but like everything, oh you like tobacco, tobacco taking tobacco might cause um lung cancer. Like everyone who takes tobacco might 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 very different, I think, between the proportion of people that develop lung cancer from agreed 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 yes, yes i think people who get eventually become psychotic like like i said you know my opinion is that they smoke cannabis to help them feel better in their mental health problem not because they're smoking it they're developing the psychosis they're going to develop the psychotic uh, symptoms anyway and the cannabis promotes them developing the psychotic symptoms and they use cannabis because of the effect that they get that it helps them feel better and help them cope with the anxiety with the social aspect of the schizo of the schizoaffective disorder and obviously patients with mental health issues usually consume cannabis because cannabis has a therapeutic effect on the neurotransmitters in the brain so obviously patients who are psychiatric, there's a higher patient uh, proportion of uh, psychiatric patients who use cannabis than in the normal population because cannabis is therapeutic. I just have a, sorry, sorry. Uh, um, I, just, I? Yes, I just have a question to ask related to this topic actually. Um, uh, so uh, cannabis, uh, from speaking as a lay person, you know, I'm a young woman, people in my generation have a very lenient view on cannabis, maybe because it's becoming more and more accessible. Um, some, I, I even found that there are um, menstrual relief uh, um, uh, uh, products uh, uh, containing canna cannabis. So cannabis is becoming more and more um, uh, available and maybe that's why we have a more lenient view and it's also um, marketed at least as being safe and uh, um, can we discuss uh, um, is it, if it's really safer cannabis if it's safer than for example cocaine or uh, um, heroin or metanephrines uh, please thank you can, can we make a distinction between for example recreational cannabis and medicinal cannabis and this is an important distinction to make because the difference lies 
in the fact that recreational cannabis is not regulated, medicinal cannabis is. And when a substance is regulated, when a medicinal substance is regulated, um, three factors are taken into consideration, the quality, the safety, and the efficacy. So the quality of the medicinal cannabis prior to it reaching the customer has to be ensured, meaning that the concentrations of cannabinoids, the principal cannabinoids, mostly THC and CBD in the cannabis plant, are of a known concentration. There are no um, harmful toxins um, that, might, um, uh, that might harm the patient, um, so the toxins are kept to a minimal or not at all present, uh, to a minimal concentration or not at all present. And these compounds are, for example, aflatoxins, which are um, uh, compound fungal, fungally derived products, which can uh, cause, for example, liver cancer. And uh, also pesticides are, are checked for. So the quality of cannabis, the quality of medicinal cannabis prior to it reaching the patient is, re is rigorously checked and also the safety and efficacy. So that is, I think, one of the very important distinctions that one has to make when considering the safety and of, of a medicinal product, which is highly regulated, and a recreational product, which is less regulated. And as I said before, when we compare cannabis to something like cocaine or methamphetamine, cannabis obviously has therapeutic properties which have been reported, which have been researched, which have been proven. Cocaine and methamphetamine obviously are the less and less um, uh, therapeutic. Um, when it comes to the safety of it, um, uh, what you mentioned, these menstrual um, products, most probably they're CBD based. So obviously we have to make a distinction um, between CBD and THC. CBD we know is very safe, although obviously it can have interactions with medications at high doses, um, you know, and, uh, but as a whole, it's very well tolerated. And in fact, it is uh, very widely available in many cosmetics, uh, skin products, um, food supplements, teas. Um, there are many CBD products which are um, regulated in most European countries. Um, and uh, they can be made available because they are safe and CBD. Um, it's also good to know that it is actually an antipsychotic. So when a patient is prescribed a THC-based preparation um, uh, as a medicine, we usually recommend the use of CBD combined to uh, reduce the psychotic side effects of THC because we know that THC is not safe in some in some people you know it's uh, relatively safe in i would say 99 percent of the general population but there is one percent who will develop a psychotic event or a psychotic uh, illness if they use uncontrolled thc especially from the black market where it might be you know also um, uh, it might also contain other substances which can be harmful, but um, CBD based products are, are usually extremely safe. In fact, the, the WHO has made a, a declaration that CBD is safe. Um, and uh, it's not really a drug, you know, you don't get a high from CBD. So when it comes to cannabis, we need to distinguish CBD and THC and uh, the recreational aspect of cannabis comes from THC without CBD, because actually using CBD with THC will reduce the recreational effect um, from the THC. In fact, to continue with what Dr. Aljus is saying, CBD is actually being considered now. It used to be considered as a narcotic. The United Nations are in the process of um, declassifying it as being a narcotic. And it's actually being considered um, uh, to be a novel food substance. So moving on from a narcotic and being introduced as a novel food substance, meaning that it could be marketed and sold as a, as a food supplement, not even as a medication. We also have another question from the people watching us and they have asked us, how do you differentiate between soft and hard drugs? Uh, 
Okay, don't worry, we'll move on to another question. So, uh, yes. Soft and hard drugs. I mean, hard drugs, I would say, would be those who have a higher propensity to leading to a higher abuse potential, a higher um, tolerance and dependence, uh, risk, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis soft drug, which is less, less, let's say, secretes lower amounts of dopamine, uh, predisposes the individual to be more hogged on, on, on the effects uh, produced by it. So we can say that uh, like um, uh, cannabis is more of a soft drug whilst c cannabis with CBD, while I think cannabis... Uh -huh. Cannabis usually has both CBD and THC. Um, there might be some strains which are cultivated, which um, uh, cultivators try to make the CBD concentration higher than the THC content. But till now, what, for example, is considered as cannabis is usually a mixture of both. They just differ in the ratios. Those cannabis products having a higher THC content will obviously have more of a, of a brain stimulant effect and those having less THC will have more of a, of a brain stimulating effect. I think in a nutshell, in a nutshell I agree um, in the sense that sort of soft drugs are probably less hazardous to health um, than, than the, the hard drugs, I guess. Thank you. Um... Okay, um, so if we were to discuss a bit more about drug addiction, um, uh, we usually when we, edu when we are educated about drug addiction, we are educated to avoid, but really if we were to go on the other side of the spectrum, how can I, as a person, notice that someone, what, what are the signs of addiction? And what uh, should one do, one, when should one seek help? I think First of all, one has to acknowledge that it's quite, it's not that easy to identify that someone has a drug problem. He, he might be able to um, conceal it quite well. Um, other than that, um, one may start to notice some behavioral changes, some clues, leave, the person leaving around uh, behind him at home, possible... Um, objects which he uses to, to abuse the, the substances. Um, apart from, from the behavioral changes, one may also note other physical changes in, in the individual stains, uh, either burns he may, he may make while, while abusing drugs. But again, um, especially in, in relatives and, and clo people close to us, um, it may be quite difficult to just identify it's not that simple such as when we we go to our doctor and, and check our blood pressure and, and we know that it's high um, it's a process rather than just a one-off um, thing um, so it, it's again important to make the distinction between how do you distinguish that someone is abusing of drugs versus how, how do you distinguish when someone is becoming more of an addict and there are I mean signs to exhibited by people who are addicted could be um, a lack of control to stay away from the substance so that individual would be more inclined to participate in activities where the substance, the chemical that he or she is addicted to is present. One may also manifest signs of decreased socialization, decreased, um, uh, you know, relation, it, it, it affects the, the type of relationships that one has with friends and 